Yes, my talk is uh, Future of Deployment of Elixir. It sounds very grand. Uh, it's not quite all that grand, but uh, kind of my inspiration for this talk is over the you know past couple of years in Elixir, a lot of my open source development time has been focused on uh, XRM, which is a release management tool uh, that many of you may have used or at least heard of. Uh, and this year in particular, I spent a lot of time more on uh, the DevOps side, uh, thanks as my current employer. Um, so I got a, a really good chance to uh, push XRM and releases in general and find places that were pain points for myself, um, but then also think about what kinds of things I really cared about when I was doing deployment. Um, and basically the number one conclusion that I come away from is deployment is very hard, right? Uh, every environment is very different. Uh, we all have different requirements for what we need uh, from our production systems and how we do things like monitoring and logging and so on. Um, so for a tool like XRM, it's extremely difficult to build this one thing that just works perfect for everyone. Um, and XRM tried to do that uh, to a great deal. Uh, so you know the idea is that tools like XRM are really supposed to help with this kind of thing, right? Like your language-based tools are supposed to uh, make your life easier, not add more complication, uh, not cause you problems. It's, you wouldn't otherwise expect to encounter. Um, and XRM, to a certain degree, helped quite a deal with this, but uh, there were definitely times where it caused more problems for people uh, than if they had not used it to begin with. Um, this is basically how I do deployment today in Elixir. Uh, it's just chaos. Uh, there's not a whole lot of good uh, guidance or documentation. Uh, you know, we have no consensus on what the one true way of deploying an Elixir application is. There's really two primary paths, right? Uh, releases or running with just mix. So you do mix run, dash dash no halt, and your application is not running. Uh, but everything else around deploying your application uh, is kind of up to you. Uh, so it's more or less figure it out as you go kind of scenario. And for a lot of people, they have their opinions on how they want to run their applications, and that's fine. But when you look at other communities, like uh, at work, I use uh, Erlang and Elixir predominantly, uh, but we also have Go applications uh, and a few other ones like Node and stuff. But uh, the Go applications are the one that really speak to me because uh, you, know, you do a build, you have a single binary, you drop that on whatever box you want to run it on, and boom, you're good to go. Um, to me, that's how deployment should work. It should be a self-contained package uh, that just kind of is super easy to deploy, uh, easy to reason about. You don't have any uh, sticky dependencies. Like for me, the nastiest of the applications that we have to deal with is based on Node because uh, you basically have to pollute your entire production host machine with dependencies unless you're running containers. Um, so, to focus my efforts on like what I want to do next with deployment uh, tooling in Elixir, I really wanted to define what good deployments really mean or what good deployment infrastructure is. So, that's highly automated, right? Like, you want to be pretty much hands off for the most of it. Um, and this is sort of oriented around uh, continuous deployment, right? Um, so, you have a highly automated environment. Your builds are reproducible, right? So you have an artifact that's produced by this deployment pipeline, and you want that to live indefinitely, so that uh, if you need to roll back to another version, it's simply just dropping that package on the machine that you want to run and starting it up, uh, and you're good to go. Uh, you don't want to have to rebuild and potentially get like different versions of your dependencies, or uh, you want it to be this image almost, right? Uh, you want your deployments to require minimal or no downtime. Um, no downtime is a bit of a tricky subject, uh, but there's ways where you can implement that even when you don't have like hot upgrades in place, right? Uh, things like AV style deployments with uh, intelligent routing. Uh, so you have the appearance of no downtime, even though you may actually have uh, a 
little bit in there. But the idea there is that when you're doing automated deployments, uh, you press a button to do a build, it generates the artifact, rolls it into production, and your customers shouldn't see any downtime. Um, the other thing is you need to have tooling for doing easy troubleshooting of your deployed artifact. So if you've got an application production that's uh, you know, flapping up and down and you're not sure what's going on, you want to have all the tooling in place to easily jump onto that machine, uh, try to do things out, run some commands and see what's going on. Um, and you also want to be able to roll back uh, in the case of those issues very easily uh, without too much uh, stickiness there when you uh, have to roll back versions of dependencies, like especially if you've got system libs that you depend on. Um, and basically to achieve these kinds of goals in Elixir, uh, we need to use releases. This is true of Erlang as well, but um, releases are e either contribute to each of these things in some degree or another, or are a requirement for it. Um, for instance, you know, uh, easy troubleshooting, you can do with fixed run, uh, but out of the box of the releases, you get a remote console. Um, you get some of those introspection tools. They're easy to use right out of the box. Uh, no downtime uh, via hot upgrades if you decide to use those. Um, the build artifacts re releases are a tarball that lives indefinitely, includes the early runtime. So you can jump back to a release two years ago and fire it up, and it should just work. You know, obviously, if your infrastructure has changed, it might not, but uh, it contributes a great deal to these. And with the release tooling that currently exists, you know, it's very automated. This is how you should feel when you're using releases. <laughs> uh, so, you know, again, releases are self-contained, but uh, Tarball contains everything that's needed to run it. So it's, in a lot of ways, very similar to uh, Go Build, where you get a binary that you can drop on the machine. It's not quite as nice as just that self-contained binary, but it is a package that you can drop on a machine with no external dependencies. Uh, reproducible. And consistent too, like when you have that release tarball, um, other than potentially external dependencies on native libraries, deploying to uh, different versions of Linux or uh, a EC2 instance versus an embedded device, the deployment process is basically the same. Drop that tarball on that machine, extract it, and run your app. Um, you don't have to worry about, okay, well, I need to install Erlang and Elixir and all the right Erlang packages. Um, I need to make sure that I can build my app and fetch all my dependencies. And that's not consistent just by definition. Um, where with a release, you don't have to worry about any of that. Uh, particularly with embedded devices, that's where you notice the biggest uh, difference, in my opinion. Uh, you know, having to build Erlang or Elixir on Raspberry Pi, if you've ever done that, is just awful. And again, like releases were purpose built for this. This is why they exist in the first place. I actually tried to do some digging to find out uh, what the original design was behind uh, the SysTools and Release Handler modules in OTP. I still haven't been able to find it. I went back all the way to like R4 or something like that uh, in the Git repository to try and figure out how it evolved. Um, but that's been lost to history as far as I can tell so far. But the idea is that from day one with Erlang, they knew that deployment was a very, very important topic and releases were their solution to that. And they've lived to this day because they are so flexible. Unfortunately, with releases, the tooling is awful. And, uh, you know, I wrote one of them and even I can admit that. And the reason why it's awful is not because it doesn't work or anything like that. It's actually extremely easy to use initially. Um, but there's a lot of sticky corners where either documentation is lagging or the logging that you get from the tools is not particularly informative uh, or it lets you do things that are broken up front, but it doesn't tell you until you try and run your release. Uh, there's just a lot of lacking areas that even after like three years, I still haven't solved properly in XRM. Uh, Relics is the other primary 
the least generation tool, and externalization is built on top of relics. Um, but one of the reasons why XRM has issues with like informative error messages and such is because I don't actually have any control over uh, how relics does things, so I have to handle relics error messages. Um, so in general, the tooling has suffered from poor user experience. Uh, it's not tailored towards people who have zero to no understanding of releases. Uh, there's no real clear documentation on releases for uh, new users of either Erlang or Elixir. You basically have to dive into the Erlang manual to try and learn those things. Um, which unfortunately, if you've ever spent any time doing it, is very descriptive, but uh, not at all suitable for tutorial type. <laughs> so, the summer, excuse me, uh, basically, actually, I submitted the premise of this talk before I wrote this application. <laughs> <laughs> I had actually been talking with Jose uh, this past year a couple times about how to roll release handling more properly in the mix. And uh, distillery is what came out of those ideas, those conversations, um, and it, it, it kind of turned out that I don't feel that it belongs in mix anymore for a variety of reasons that I may get into um, a little bit later, but the uh, point is that it lives as a separate library now. Uh, the benefits are, though, that it integrates very tightly with mix. It's written entirely in Elixir, and it's much smaller. Um, and more flexible than XRM could be by definition just because it uses the information that uh, Mix contains, which I couldn't previously use uh, when we were wrapping Relux. Uh, its emphasis is on a small core, similar to Plug, where you know, it focuses specifically on generating a release package and handling configuration around the packaging, uh, but then leaves all the kind of extension points up to you. Uh, so if you need to add something like I don't know how many people here used to perform uh, with XRM, but previously I had actually hacked and uh, stuff specifically for conform into the script that XRM generated. Um, the start script for XRM, if you haven't used it before, is just a, sh uh, just a shell script that like sets up the code paths and a bunch of other stuff. Um, so I had to like dump a bunch of conform specific code into that shell script because I didn't have any other way to make it more work the way it does. Um, now with Distillery, I can actually make that as a plugin, uh, a little shell script shim that gets executed before a release starts. Uh, and the same kind of thing can be done by any one of you if you're using Distillery. Uh, it also has an emphasis on being as configurable as possible. So XRM uh, was very opinionated and actually inflexible in some ways. Um, I don't really want to dive too deep into what all those places were, but needless to say, there were definitely used cases where uh, XRM would cause you problems. Um, XRM did have a plugin system. Uh, Distillery is, is actually richer because not only does it have XRM's plugin system, uh, but you can add custom shell commands, uh, and then there's the restart, restop hooks that I was talking about that I used to conform. Um, the other thing that was a big focus with the distillery was that the XRM umbrella projects were poorly, poorly supported. Like, they basically didn't work. I mean, they did, but yeah. you had to build a release for each application in your umbrella, and maybe that's what you wanted, but maybe not. Uh, with distillery, you can build either separate releases for a given application or some combination. So you can build a single release with every uh, application in your umbrella, or maybe you would have two releases with two applications from your umbrella and one application in the other release. Point being that like, you can structure your releases however you need to for your environment, your needs. Uh, and the other emphasis was on fixing the user experience around the tools. So more informative errors, like only show information that is important or that you really care about. Um, and there might even still be cases where I can trim some of that down. Um, but I really wanted to make error messages in, in particular a lot more informative um, and warnings a lot more informative. 
on an early version of the distillery, I actually automatically wired up uh, dependencies into the application tools. That was a super common issue with XRM, was people would forget to put applications from their dependencies in their applications list. They'd start the release, and the application wouldn't start. It failed saying that some application, its code was missing. Uh, that part of it has actually been fixed. So code for any dependencies you have will automatically be added to the release. Um, the only thing that you still are responsible for is putting things on the applications list to define how those applications are started. Um, so whether it's automatically started or whether you want uh, the code loading type to just be load. So maybe you have dependencies that you want to man manually start, but uh, you don't want to make it an included application. Uh, there's a lot more flexibility there. And for many of you, that may not at all be relevant, but for the few of you that ran into that with XRM quite often, uh, that's been addressed from the ground up. Unfortunately, there's still quite a bit of work to be done with Distillery. I mean, it's what I would recommend you use from this point forward. Uh, do not use XRM, use Distillery because my efforts are focused on Distillery, and at this point, it's uh, you know, at parity with XRM, if not past. Uh, what is lacking today is Windows support, uh, federal runtime configuration, really. So, if you haven't used releases, there's uh, with a regular mix application, you have config.exs. Uh, when you're using releases, that is actually compiled into a static config file called sys.config. Uh, but there's also vm.args, which tells you the early VM how to start up um, really high-level uh, bits of information like the code loading mode and the code paths and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, point is that right now all that is different and there's not really intuitive understanding of like how your config.exs gets converted into sys.config. Uh, even with distillery, I've had a couple issues already with people uh, using like function calls in config.exs and then wondering why their config is broke in the release. Uh, so the tooling around that I want to fix. And I also want to make it so that the vm.args and the sys.config are integrated a little bit more tightly. Uh, one of the tools I wrote early on in Conform uh, was an attempt at handling this to a, a degree. And it, it solves uh, having a config file that maps a little bit more cleanly in the way to way users manage configuration that. So it's in an in itself config. Uh, I want something like that for releases, except for I want it to be more like config.exs. Uh, single place where you manage your configuration uh, for runtime uh, that maps very cleanly to the way you think about config.exs without as much of that clean break where things don't work the way you expect. I also want to focus on preventing errors. So what I mean by that is instead of building a release, trying to run it, and then finding out, oh, it's broken, I forgot to do something. As soon as the release builder knows like there is an issue here, that should stop the world and say, here's exactly what's wrong, here's how to fix it. Uh, basically, make it so that I save your time instead of waste it. Uh, XRM was not very good about that. It, it couldn't warn you in all places because it, a lot of it lived in Relax and I didn't have control over it. Now I do with Distillery because Distillery rewrites all of that and we're not about it. The other one is better handling of new dependencies. Like there, to a degree, this is beyond the scope of a tool like Distillery or XRM. Um, this gets deeper into one of the things I really want to solve, which is documentation and practical practical experience, like documenting how to do things with releases. Uh, the other one is releasing to a cluster. Like right now, I haven't even bothered to document uh, an extra on how you would push a release to a cluster of nodes and then upgrade them all simultaneously. Uh, but that's a thing that you can do. There's no reason why you can't, but without any documentation around it, uh, either nobody's going to do it or those that do try are going to have a bunch of trouble with it and they'll give up. Uh, This is kind of the caveat there. We need to make releases easy to understand. Um, 
not just the conceptual like color structure and stuff, but how you deploy them, right? Uh, I was trying to think of a way to like describe this, and what I came, with, came up with here is at the bottom, make it easy or it's easy to get wrong. Um, with releases, there's so many different bits of information um, that haven't been well documented, and there's not a lot of good guides or anything like that out there. Um, I want to make releases so easy that you can't get them wrong. Um, that it's just build your release, drop it on the box you want to run on, and it just works. Um, that's the goal with, it was the goal with x too, 2 but um, there were limitations there. And my goal with distillery and moving forward in the future is to do exactly that. Um, so part of that is from documentation, right? Like guides, tutorials, documenting practical experience, like real world situations that other people can borrow knowledge from. Um, to give an example would be like, okay, I'm moving from manually managed infrastructure to something running under Kubernetes. Like how do I set that up? How do I use releases in that environment? Um, you know, there's a, kind of a gradient between what is a tutorial, what's a guide, and what's a practical experience, but um, I think that a lot of that needs to be documented and then centralized, make it easy for people to find that information. Right now, you're basically hoping that when you do a Google search, you'll find something, and that when you do find something, it's not horribly outdated. Uh, with Distillery, I've put a lot more effort into collecting that kind of information and putting effort into guides. Um, I've actually gotten quite a bit of help already uh, putting together uh, practical guides. I'm working on PR with someone right now uh, to get one specifically for Phoenix. Like, how do I generate a new release of a Phoenix application? How do I make some changes and, and do hot upgrades and see those things change? Um, that one's actually about to be published probably in the next day or two, but. Um, those kinds of things are very much close to the distillery, and right now we're going to be living under the distillery hex stocks page. But um, in the future, I'd really like to make that more of like a Elixir Lang organization type documentation. Um, you know, it should be on the Elixir Lang website under the tutorials. You know, how do I do releases? How do I deploy my application? I really think that that kind of guidance should be. Uh, something that people think about from day one. Because it's the kind of thing that they're going to have to answer for when they want to convince the boss to let them use Elixir at work. Like, okay, we already have a deployment infrastructure, how are we going to fit Elixir into that? Uh, and by making all these things available, guys, tutorials, practical experiences, people will be able to sell that a lot easier. <coughs> And the other one is, you know, kind of, I've been touching on this continuously here, but improving the tools. So, the distillery is already much better than XRM, but there's still a lot more to, to be done. Um, one of the things I, I think I've more or less solved with distillery is this idea of intuitive defaults, right? Um, one of the capabilities that was present with releases is this idea of you building a release, but all of the beam files and file artifacts are simulated into the release allowing you to make code changes and rebuild the release super fast without having to change much. Um, allowing you to kind of emulate your production environment but iterate quickly on fixes. Um, with facility, <coughs> there's a concept of environments, right? So out of the box, when you generate the release config file, you get two environments, dev and prod. Um, when you just build a release with mixed equals dev, uh, it runs with that dev mode in mind, so release builds are super fast. Um, some of those intuitive defaults are now part of that default config that's generated, and I want to continue to tweak those until it gets to the point where uh, when you build a release, it behaves the same way as when you're doing your development work with mixed run. Um, the big one, too, is XRM uh, heavily expected that you were going to provide it direction. Like it trusts that if you set some big options, you knew what you were doing, um, and that if things broke, it was your fault. And I really am convinced that that's the wrong way to do tooling, um, and that this 
said, tools like XRM or distillers should be telling you, hey, uh, you probably shouldn't do this for this reason, you should try this instead. Or, hey, you did this wrong, it's gonna cause you problems, please fix this. Uh, and that ties into the next one, a form of warnings and errors, uh, similar to the way Elm compiler works. Uh, when, it, when you do something wrong, it explains very clearly what you did wrong and why it's wrong and how to fix it. And I think uh, distillery can do that for the classic problems that affect people most commonly. And I've got a huge list of those from XRM because the issues list there is like 300 and so long. Uh, and the key part of that is preventing invalid configuration too. A lot of the errors that were generated with uh, XRM were completely due to invalid <laughs> configuration that XRM didn't bother checking or lying about. Distillery does a better job of that, but there's still room for improvement there. Um, another thing that came to me too is, you know, XRM very much tried to do as much as possible for you. Um, and I kind of arrived at the belief that we should be building on each other's tools as much as possible because the ecosystem benefits greatly from that. You know, Distillery builds on SysTools, Release Handler, and Mix. Uh, and a couple of the tools that I know of that build on other tools like this, uh, eDeliver is a great example, uh, built on XRM originally, but now also offers distillery support. Uh, and I just read about one I think, a couple days ago, uh, Gatling, I think, by Hashrock, that also does a similar thing, uh, only with XRM currently, as far as I know. But, uh, point being, <laughs> You know, tools like these build on each other and improve on areas that those tools don't focus on. Like, Distillery builds the tooling around generating release um, in a way that makes it easy for developers to get started. SysTools is a very low-level API. Mix doesn't focus on releases at all, but contains a lot of very valuable information for generating those releases. Likewise, eDeliver can rely on Distillery to generate a release package, but they can handle automating the deployment of that which is basically its purpose. Uh, I really think that we should be building tools like that. Um, so, you know, distillery being like a foundational layer and e-deliver automating some things on top of that, but there's some horizontal room for uh, building as well, particularly around distillery. You know, with XRM, there was plugins that did things like generate RPMs. Uh, you could generate a Docker image from a release package as well. So, uh, one of the things I want to do as part of this, um, in the interest of giving people some hands-on experience, or my hand-on experience with working with releases of production and deploying Elixir applications, um, it may very well widely vary from how you've done it yourself, or maybe you haven't deployed any to production yet, but hopefully it helps, and uh, I want to see people doing more of this, sharing their experiences, uh, documenting it, that eventually we'll get to a point where these problems are easily answered. So my employer, as I said, is a IOC platform as a service company, right? So uh, we're working primarily with industrial embedded devices, but consumer ones as well. Um, so we handle connectivity from the device to our platform. Within the platform, there's a bunch of microservices that handle things like SMS, uh, scripting, time series storage, key value storage, uh, things like that. The core of the platform is uh, Erlang and Elixir, but there's microservices written, like I was saying earlier, in Go, Node, and some other ones. Uh, our original architecture uh, was all Erlang, uh, manually managed infrastructure. Uh, we were doing hot upgrades, but all those were handwritten. Um, today, our new platform is hosted under OpenShift Origin, which is a open source product um, that has a commercial variant of it um, built by Red Hat. Um, and basically, it's a wrapper for Kubernetes and Docker uh, that adds a bunch of nice stuff onto it. So, an intelligent routing layer with HAProxy. Um, has a bunch of templates for doing things like uh, Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana, um, 
things like that. So we're leveraging OpenShift to do containerized infrastructure with Kubernetes being our scheduling layer. Uh, the way our continuous integration pipeline works is that we do pushes to GitHub. Uh, those trigger webhooks which notify OpenShift that, hey, there's new code that needs to be built. It clones that repository, it does a Docker build of the Docker file that exists in that repository. Uh, and those Docker files generate a release tarball, strip out everything that's not related to the release itself, uh, and then pushes that image, which is very small, like 30 some megabytes, uh, to the image repository. And then Kubernetes sched schedules out uh, the replacement of existing pods uh, with new ones. Pods is like, Kubernetes uh, terminology for a given container pool. Um, the way that we've started to do things more recently is uh, readiness and liveness checks. And one of the things that releases allow us to do, and particularly distillery, is extend uh, the start script with things that we can do to probe the state of the system. So when Kubernetes starts to roll out new versions of the application, that's being upgraded, uh, it will run this probe so that we can see like, okay, our database services are up, uh, our application points are ready, okay, thumbs up, go ahead and roll out the rest of the instances. And we'll do this until the deployment is complete, basically a rolling upgrade. Um, previously, we were just letting it do a replacement of things and if it failed, it would roll back. Now with the readiness and liveness checks, we can actually make sure that the app is ready to go and actually good uh, before we start rolling traffic onto it. Um, OpenShift actually handles also uh, AP deployments, so uh, using label selectors in Kubernetes, we can say, all right, leave this group of pods uh, undeployed, and then we can flip the switch once we're ready and replace all, or like send all the traffic to the new pods. Uh, this has worked really well so far in practice. Uh, setting up OpenShift was actually a huge effort. Um, it was why I basically got more involved on the DevOps side uh, this year was because I pushed for Kubernetes and then discovered OpenShift and pushed us towards OpenShift and then it was my problem to figure out how we were going to get that deployed <laughs> in production. Uh, and it was kind of a nightmare. We're out on Amazon, so uh, there's an Amazon playbook for setting up OpenShift, and they're like, oh yeah, that should work fine. And then you find out that every time you run this playbook, uh, you get a different result, which is really awesome. Um, so yeah, we, there are a lot of lessons to be learned along the way there. Um, try to think. A couple other small details, like we're just logging standard out and uh, using FluentD to pull logs from the containers and pipe them into the Elf stack, which is a Elasticsearch log stack. Um, um, and that's worked really well for us. One of the lessons that we did learn now is that if you are not careful about making sure you've got a tracking ID through your logs, you're going to have a bad time. Um, that was something that moving from a very monolithic architecture to a, a much broader set of microservices uh, started to be a problem real fast. Something that I'm sure many of you already know, but it was my first time seeing like the side effects of poor logging when you're not responsible for the services being written. Um, the other big practical experience that I kind of wanted to touch on a little bit was clustering. Um, so. Chris talked about uh, presence and distributed Phoenix to some degree. Um, and <coughs> Eric over in the PG2 talk also uh, discussed that to some degree. Uh, my practical experience with it is that uh, it was a very tricky problem, like harder than you'd expect, um, because Erlang makes it so easy to connect things and run things in a distributed way that by the time you start actually thinking about the guarantees that you need to provide and how you're going to design your system, you're already in production. Um, and we ran into that. So one of the things 
one of the key components of our system is this dispatcher process, which uh, basically acts as a router, but it holds a process for each connection that lives uh, to do message ordering for that connection. Uh, what we ended up doing there was clustering a bunch of nodes together and sending messages for a given connection to whichever node called that connection process. I initially tried to pull that with uh, global, completely fell down. Um, did it with GPROC, which worked a little bit, but then when process registry grows to like 100,000 connections, uh, GPROC starts to have serious problems synchronizing the registry when nodes come up and down during rolling upgrades. Um, so then I ended up having to implement my own process registry, distributed process registry, which we're using now and works fine. Uh, but if you have to do that yourself, uh, it's kind of a nasty problem to try and wrap your head around. And uh, I guess my advice from that is definitely avoid doing distributed Erlang unless you have a good reason to do it. If you can just solve your problem with load balancing, you don't need to rely on Erlang's distribution to do that for you. Uh, I'm sure there's probably people that wouldn't agree with me on that, but that is my feeling on it. Uh, last but not least, I, I felt like uh, Chris kind of touched on this a little bit, but releases and containers, uh, I have the opposite opposite of Chris, which is that I do think releases are a good fit for containers, except when you're doing hot upgrades. If you're doing hot upgrades, you should not be using Docker with releases. It's not going to mesh well, because they're meant to be stateless, um, immutable images, and hot upgrades by definition are immutable. So if you're changing your containers that way, as soon as that container goes down and you restart, it's going to be running all over. Um, so that was uh, not a problem that I ran into, because I kind of already knew that I shouldn't be doing that. Um, but some people might start running releases in production and expect that they can do a lot of upgrades and then wonder why things are not working properly. Um, the reason why I felt that releases are a good fit for containers is because, uh, you know, similar to the go build thing, once you have that binary, like your actual images can be extremely small, on the order of like 20 to 30 megabytes, and you can trim it down even more if you know exactly what packages you need. Um, our containers are built on Alpha and Linux. They have like hardly any dependencies in them, other than the ones that are absolutely required. And when you have really small image sizes like that, it's super easy to run a ton of them. Um, so that was my experience with running uh, releases under Docker. And I think that in the future, that's going to be very much a more common scenario. Uh, you know, one of the problems of thinking in terms of like, okay, well, we've got Erlang Elixir. We don't really need to use Docker uh, because we can do hot upgrades and stuff like that, is that all the other infrastructure that you may rely on could end up focusing more on containers as a way of executing this. So if you want to run on something like Kafka, maybe it's easier for them to deploy that as a container image instead of uh, a bunch of packages that you now have to install and post and manually manage. Uh, I, I do think that there's going to be increased movement towards containerized infrastructure in the future, and that we should embrace that as much as possible rather than rejecting it, because in the one scenario, it doesn't work <laughs> particularly well. Um, and the other tag out there is for cloud upgrades, is they're super easy to start using, and then they get very difficult very fast. Uh, namely, uh, you have to write app files by hand when you run into a scenario where you have to do something tricky during an upgrade. Uh, that's what we did on our old version of the platform, is all of our Apple files were handwritten. Like we weren't even, XRM and Distillery both generate Apple files for you uh, as best they can. But in the case of our old infrastructures, we weren't even doing that. Like we were just handwriting the Apple files, and it's a huge effort. It almost takes more time to do that than to like roll it into production, see how it breaks, fix the problem, roll it back out again. Um, and that's one of the problems I want to solve with XRM Distillery, but I, I'm kind of up to believe that hot upgrades are more trouble than they're worth, for the most part. Um, 
I would say that it shouldn't be an area that we focus on particularly much other than in certain edge cases. Um, one of the places that we do use hologrades is actually is our connectivity layer because we can do upgrades without dropping connections. So that's the one place where I feel like it makes some sense. But if you've got a retry mechanism and devices that are making the connections, you may not even need to do that because they'll just retry as soon as the connection is dropped. Um, that was a whole bunch of rather unorganized thoughts, but I was trying to think about how best to describe uh, some of the practical experiences I've had this year, uh, and this is kind of what shook out of it, I suppose. Uh, so I learned from last year that people had a ton of questions, um, so I want to make sure that I offer as much time as possible to ask questions, particularly about distillery, um, but any questions you may have about deploying with releases in general, or even about extra or anything like that. Go ahead. Um, uh, I've been playing around with distillery. I've been playing with uh, distillery, formerly XRM at work, and I've bumped into a lot of the stuff you talked about. Um, one thing I don't have a good answer for yet is uh, uh, is there a great play, is, there, is there a recommended approach to uh, building releases and going out and then fetching? Uh, like sensitive things later, like maybe like an API key oh, yeah. or, or, or something like that, so so that it's not baked into the release. Uh, how, how do you handle that, I guess? Yeah, that was actually something I meant to touch on, and I kind of forgot about the runtime configuration. So uh, we're almost kind of cheating with our social work because it's containerized. Uh, Kubernetes has two concepts for configuration, one is uh, environments, and the other one is secrets, where it pops a volume. <laughs> with the data that is secret. Um, we're using both to varying degrees. Uh, primarily, we're using environment variables because that meshes really well with uh, the sysconfig and both XRM and Distillery's capability to swap out uh, config variables with environment, the contents of our environment variable. Um, so there's a replace OS bars environment variable that the start script will look for. And if that is set, it will look for dollar sign environment variable name in sysconfig and vm.args and do a string replacement on that. Um, that's what we're using for most of our configuration. There's a few things that we're using for the secrets for, but uh, both are perfectly fine approaches to it. I would, I would say that environment variables are the easiest way to do it. Um, another approach might be uh, source of some sort of configuration management system like Chef or Puppet or whatever to revision big files as needed. I'm afraid we're out of time. Please give Paul a big hand.